The accumulation of capital, though originally appearing as its quantitative extension only, is effected, as we have seen, under a progressive qualitative change in its composition, under a constant increase of its constant, at the expense of its variable constituent. Footnote. Note in the third German edition. In Marx's copy there is here the marginal note. Here, note for working out later, if the extension is only quantitative, then for a greater and smaller capital in the same branch of business, the profits are as the magnitudes of the capitals advanced. If the quantitative extension induces the qualitative change, then the rate of profit on the larger capital rises simultaneously. Friedrich Engels, End note. The specifically capitalist mode of production, the development of the productive power of labor corresponding to it, and the change thence resulting in the organic composition of capital, do not merely keep pace with the advance of accumulation, or with the growth of social wealth. They develop at a much quicker rate, because mere accumulation, the absolute increase of the total social capital, is accompanied by the centralization of the individual capitals, of which the total is made up, and because the change in the technological composition of the additional capital goes hand in hand with a similar change in the technological composition of the original capital. With the advance of accumulation, therefore, the proportion of constant to variable capital changes. If it was originally, say, 1-1, one, one, it now becomes successively 2-1, 3-1, 4-1, 5-1, 7-1, etc., so that as the capital increases, instead of one-half its total value, only one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth, one-sixth, one-eighth, etc., is transformed into labor power, and on the other hand, two-thirds, three-quarters, four-fifths, five-sixths, seven-eighths into means of production. Since the demand for labor is determined not by the amount of capital as a whole, but by its variable constituent alone, that demand falls progressively with the increase of the total capital, instead of, as previously assumed, rising in proportion to it. It falls relatively to the magnitude of the total capital, and at an accelerated rate, as this magnitude increases. With the growth of the total capital, its variable constituent, or the labor incorporated in it, also does increase, but in a constantly diminishing proportion. The intermediate pauses are shortened, in which accumulation works as simple extension of production, on a given technical basis. It is not merely that an accelerated accumulation of total capital, accelerated in a constantly growing progression, is needed to absorb an additional number of laborers, or even, on account of the constant metamorphosis of old capital, to keep employed those already functioning. In its turn, this increasing accumulation and centralization becomes a source of new changes in the composition of capital, of a more accelerated diminution of its variable, as compared with its constant constituent. This accelerated relative diminution of the variable constituent that goes along with the accelerated increase of the total capital, and moves more rapidly than this increase, takes the inverse form, at the other pole, of an apparently absolute increase of the laboring population, an increase always moving more rapidly than that of the variable capital or the means of employment. But, in fact, it is capitalistic accumulation itself that constantly produces, and produces in the direct ratio of its own energy and extent, a relatively redundant population of laborers, i.e., a population of greater extent than suffices for the average needs of the self-expansion of capital, and therefore a surplus population. Considering the social capital in its totality, the movement of its accumulation now causes periodical changes, affecting it more or less as a whole now distributes its various phases simultaneously over the different spheres of production. In some spheres, a change in the composition of capital occurs without increase of its absolute magnitude, as a consequence of simple centralization. In others, the absolute growth of capital is connected with absolute diminution of its variable constituent, or of the labor power absorbed by it. In others, again, capital continues growing for a time on its given technical basis, and attracts additional labor power in proportion to its increase, while at other times it undergoes organic change, and lessens its variable constituent. In all spheres, the increase of the variable part of capital, and therefore of the number of laborers employed by it, is always connected with violent fluctuations and transitory production of surplus population, whether this takes the more striking form of the repulsion of laborers already employed, 
or the less evident but not less real form of the more difficult absorption of the additional laboring population through the usual channels. With the magnitude of social capital already functioning, and the degree of its increase, with the extension of the scale of production and the mass of the laborers set in motion, with the development of the productiveness of their labor, with the greater breadth and fullness of all sources of wealth, there is also an extension of the scale on which greater attraction of laborers by capital is accompanied by their greater repulsion. The rapidity of the change in the organic composition of capital, and in its technical form increases, and an increasing number of spheres of production becomes involved in this change, now simultaneously, now alternately. The laboring population therefore produces, along with the accumulation of capital produced by it, the means by which it in itself is made relatively superfluous, is turned into a relative surplus population, and it does this to an always increasing extent. This is a law of population peculiar to the capitalist mode of production, and in fact every special historic mode of production has its own special laws of population, historically valid within its limits, and only in so far as man has not interfered with them. Footnote. Added in the fourth German edition, the law of progressive diminution of the relative magnitude of variable capital, and its effect on the condition of the class of wage workers, is conjectured rather than understood by some of the prominent economists of the classical school. The greatest service was rendered here by John Barton, although he, like all the rest, lumps together constant and fixed capital, the variable and circulating capital. He says, quote, The demand for labor depends on the increase of circulating, and not of fixed capital. Were it true that the proportion between these two sorts of capital is the same at all times, and in all circumstances, then indeed it follows that the number of laborers employed is in proportion to the wealth of the state. But such a proposition has not the semblance of probability. As arts are cultivated, and civilization is extended, fixed capital bears a larger and larger proportion to circulating capital. The amount of fixed capital employed in the production of a piece of British muslin is at least a hundred, probably a thousand times greater, than that employed in a similar piece of Indian muslin. And the proportion of circulating capital is a hundred or a thousand times less. The whole of the annual savings added to the fixed capital would have no effect in increasing the demand for labor. End quote. John Barton, Observations on the Circumstances Which Influence the Condition of the Laboring Classes of Society, London, 1817, page 16, 17. Quote, the same cause which may increase the net revenue of the country may at the same time render the population redundant and deteriorate the condition of the laborer. End quote. Ricardo, 1st C., page 469. With an increase of capital, Quote, the demand for labor will be in a diminishing ratio. I bid, page 480, note. Quote, the amount of capital devoted to the maintenance of labor may vary, independently of any changes in the whole amount of capital. Great fluctuations in the amount of employment, and great suffering may become more frequent as capital itself becomes more plentiful. End quote. Richard Jones, An Introductory Lecture on Political Economy, London, 1833, page 13. Quote, Demand for labor will rise, not in proportion to the accumulation of the general capital. Every augmentation, therefore, in the national stock destined for reproduction, comes in the progress of society to have less and less influence upon the conditions of the laborer. Ramsey, 1st C., pages 90 and 91. End note. But if a surplus laboring population is a necessary product of accumulation or of the development of wealth on a capitalist basis, this surplus population becomes, conversely, the lever of capitalistic accumulation, nay, a condition of existence of the capitalist mode of production. It forms a disposable industrial reserve army that belongs to capital quite as absolutely as if the latter had bred it at its own cost. Independently of the limits of the actual increase of population, it creates, for the changing needs of the self-expansion of capital, a mass of human material always ready for exploitation. With accumulation, and the development of the productiveness of labor that accompanies it, the power of sudden expansion of capital grows also. It grows not merely because the elasticity of the capital already functioning increases, not merely because the absolute wealth of society expands,
of which capital only forms an elastic part, not merely because credit, under every special stimulus, at once places an unusual part of this wealth at the disposal of production, in the form of additional capital, it grows also because the technical conditions of the process of production themselves, machinery, means of transport, etc., now must admit of the rapidest transformation of masses of surplus product into additional means of production. The mass of social wealth, overflowing with the advance of accumulation, and transformable into additional capital, thrusts itself frantically into the old branches of production, whose market suddenly expands, or into newly formed branches, such as railways, etc., the need for which grows out of the development of the old ones. In all such cases there must be the possibility of throwing great masses of men suddenly on the decisive points, without injury to the scale of production in other spheres. Overpopulation supplies these masses. The coarse characteristic of modern industry, viz., a decennial cycle, interrupted by smaller oscillations, of periods of average activity, production at a high pressure, crisis and stagnation, depends on the constant formation, the greater or less absorption, and the reformation of the industrial reserve army or surplus population. In their turn, the varying phases of the industrial cycle recruit the surplus population, and become one of the most energetic agents of its reproduction. This peculiar course of modern industry, which occurs in no earlier period of human history, was also impossible in the childhood of capitalist production. The composition of capital changed but very slowly. With its accumulation, therefore, there kept pace, on the whole, a corresponding growth in the demand for labor. Slow as was the advance of accumulation, compared with that of more modern times, it found a check in the natural limits of the exploitable laboring population, limits which could only be got rid of by forcible means to be mentioned later. The expansion by fits and starts of the scale of production is the preliminary to its equally sudden contraction. The latter again evokes the former, but the former is impossible without disposable human material, without an increase in the number of laborers, independently of the absolute growth of the population. This increase is effected by the simple process that constantly sets free a part of the laborers, by methods which lessen the number of laborers employed in proportion to the increased production. The whole form of the movement of modern industry depends, therefore, upon the constant transformation of a part of the laboring population into unemployed or half-employed hands. The superficiality of political economy shows itself in the fact that it looks upon the expansion and contraction of credit which is a mere symptom of the periodic changes of the industrial cycle, as their cause. As the heavenly bodies, once thrown into a certain definite motion, always repeat this, so is it with social production as soon as it is once thrown into this movement of alternate expansion and contraction. Effects in their turn become causes, and the varying accidents of the whole process, which always reproduces its own conditions, take on the form of periodicity. When this periodicity is once consolidated, even political economy then sees that the production of a relative surplus population, i.e., surplus with regard to the average needs of the self-expansion of capital, is a necessary condition of modern industry. Suppose, says H. Merivale, formerly professor of political economy at Oxford, subsequently employed in the English colonial office, suppose that, on the occasion of some of these crises, the nation were to rouse itself to the effort of getting rid, by emigration, of some hundreds of thousands of superfluous arms, what would be the consequence? That, at the first returning demand for labor, there would be a deficiency. However rapid reproduction may be, it takes, at all events, the space of a generation to replace the loss of adult labor. Now, the profits of our manufacturers depend mainly on the power of making use of the prosperous moment when demand is brisk, and thus compensating themselves for the interval during which it is slack. This power is secured to them only by the command of machinery and of manual labor. They must have hands ready by them, they must be able to increase the activity of their operations when required, and to slacken it again, according to the state of the market, or they cannot possibly maintain that preeminence in the race of competition on which the wealth of the country is founded. Footnote. H. Merivale, 
Lectures on Colonialization and Colonies, 1841, Volume 1, page 146. End note. Even Malthus recognizes overpopulation as a necessity of modern industry, though after his narrow fashion he explains it by the absolute overgrowth of the laboring population, not by their becoming relatively supernumerary. He says, Prudential habits with regard to marriage, carried to a considerable extent among the laboring class of a country, mainly depending on manufacturers and commerce, might injure it. From the nature of a population, an increase of laborers cannot be brought into market in consequence of a particular demand till after the lapse of sixteen or eighteen years, and the conversion of revenue into capital, by saving, may take place much more rapidly. A country is always liable to an increase in the quantity of the funds for the maintenance of labor faster than the increase of population. Footnote. Malthus, Principles of Political Economy, pages 215, 319, and 320. In this work, Malthus finally discovers, with the help of Sismondi, the beautiful trinity of capitalistic production, over-production, over-population, over-consumption. Three very delicate monsters, indeed. See, for example, Friedrich Engels, Umrisse zu einer Kritik der National Ökonomie, First C, page 107, and forward. End note. After political economy has thus demonstrated the constant production of a relative surplus population of laborers to be a necessity of capitalistic accumulation, she very aptly, in the guise of an old maid, puts in the mouth of her beau ideal of a capitalist the following words, addressed to these supernumeraries thrown on the streets by their own creation of additional capital, We manufacturers do what we can for you, whilst we are increasing that capital on which you must subsist, and you must do the rest by accommodating your numbers to the means of subsistence. Footnote. Harriet Martineau, A Manchester Strike, 1832, page 101. End note. Capitalist production can by no means content itself with the quantity of disposable labor power which the natural increase of population yields. It requires for its free play an industrial reserve army independent of these natural limits. Up to this point it has been assumed that the increase or diminution of the variable capital corresponds rigidly with the increase or diminution of the number of laborers employed. The number of laborers commanded by capital may remain the same, or even fall, while the variable capital increases. This is the case if the individual laborer yields more labor, and therefore his wages increase, and this although the price of labor remains the same or even falls, only more slowly than the mass of labor rises. Increase of variable capital, in this case, becomes an index of more labor, but not of more laborers employed. It is the absolute interest of every capitalist to press a given quantity of labor out of a smaller, rather than a greater number of laborers, if the cost is about the same. In the latter case, the outlay of constant capital increases in proportion to the mass of labor set in action. In the former, that increase is much smaller. The more extended the scale of production, the stronger this motive. Its force increases with the accumulation of capital. We have seen that the development of the capitalistic mode of production, and of the productive power of labor, at once the cause and effect of accumulation, enables the capitalist, with the same outlay of variable capital, to set in action more labor, by greater exploitation, extensive or intensive, of each individual labor power. We have further seen that the capitalist buys, with the same capital, a greater mass of labor power, as he progressively replaces skilled laborers by less skilled, mature labor power by immature, male by female, that of adults by that of young persons or children. On the one hand, therefore, with the progress of accumulation, a larger variable capital sets more labor in action, without enlisting more laborers. On the other, a variable capital of the same magnitude sets in action more labor, with the same mass of labor power, and finally a greater number of inferior labor powers by displacement of higher. The production of a relative surplus population, or the setting free of laborers, goes on therefore yet more rapidly than the technical revolution of the process of production that accompanies, and is accelerated by, the advance of accumulation, and more rapidly than the corresponding diminution of the variable part of capital as compared with the constant. As they increase in extent and effective power, 
become to a less extent means of employment of laborers, this state of things is again modified by the fact that in proportion as the productiveness of labor increases, capital increases its supply of labor more quickly than its demand for laborers. The overwork of the employed part of the working class swells the ranks of the reserve, whilst, conversely, the greater pressure that the latter, by its competition, exerts on the former, forces these to submit to overwork, and to subjugation under the dictates of capital. The condemnation of one part of the working class to enforced idleness by the overwork of the other part, and the converse, becomes a means of enriching the individual capitalists, and accelerates at the same time the production of the industrial reserve army on a scale corresponding with the advance of social accumulation. How important is this element in the formation of the relative surplus population is shown by the example of England. Her technical means for saving labor are colossal. Nevertheless, if tomorrow morning labor generally were reduced to a rational amount, and proportioned to the different sections of the working class according to age and sex, the working population to hand would be absolutely insufficient for the carrying on of national production on its present scale. The great majority of the laborers now unproductive would have to be turned into productive ones. Footnote. Even in the cotton famine of 1863 we find, in a pamphlet of the operative cotton spinners of Blackburn, fierce denunciations of overwork, which, in consequence of the factory acts, of course only affected adult male laborers. The adult operatives at this mill have been asked to work from twelve to thirteen hours per day, while there are hundreds who are compelled to be idle who would willingly work partial time in order to maintain their families and save their brethren from a premature grave through being overworked. We, it goes on to say, would ask if the practice of working overtime by a number of hands is likely to create a good feeling between masters and servants. Those who are worked over time feel the injustice equally with those who are contemned to forced idleness. There is in the district almost sufficient work to give all partial employment if fairly distributed. We are only asking what is right in requesting the masters generally to pursue a system of short hours, particularly until a better state of things begins to dawn upon us, rather than to work a portion of the hands over time, while others, for want of work, are compelled to exist upon charity. Reports of Inspectors of Factories, October 31, 1863, page 8. The author of the essay on trade and commerce grasped the effect of a relative surplus population on the employed laborers with his usual unerring bourgeois instinct. Another cause of idleness in this kingdom is the want of a sufficient number of laboring hands. Whenever, from an extraordinary demand for manufactures, labor grows scarce, the laborers feel their own consequence, and will make their masters feel it likewise. It is amazing, but so depraved are the dispositions of these people, that in such cases a set of workmen have combined to distress the employer by idling a whole day together. Essay, etc., pages 27 and 28. The fellows, in fact, were hankering after a rise in wages. End note. Taking them as a whole, the general movements of wages are exclusively regulated by the expansion and contraction of the industrial reserve army, and these again correspond to the periodic changes of the industrial cycle. They are therefore not determined by the variations of the absolute number of the working population, but by the varying proportions in which the working class is divided into active and reserve army, by the increase or diminution in the relative amount of the surplus population, by the extent to which it is now absorbed, now set free. For modern industry, with its decennial cycles and periodic phases, which, moreover, as accumulation advances, are complicated by irregular oscillations following each other more and more quickly, that would indeed be a beautiful law, which pretends to make the action of capital dependent on the absolute variation of the population, instead of regulating the demand and supply of labor by the alternate expansion and contraction of capital. The labor market now appearing relatively under full, because capital is expanding, now again over full, because it is contracting. Yet this is the dogma of the economists. According to them, wages rise in consequence of accumulation of capital. The higher wages stimulate the working population to more rapid multiplication, and this goes on until the labor market becomes too full, and therefore capital, relatively to the supply of labor, becomes insufficient. 
Wages fall, and now we have the reverse of the metal. The working population is little by little decimated as a result of the fall in wages, so that capital is again in excess relatively to them, or, as others explain it, falling wages and the corresponding increase in the exploitation of the laborer again accelerates accumulation, whilst at the same time the lower wages hold the increase of the working class in check. Then comes again the time when the supply of labor is less than the demand, wages rise, and so on. A beautiful mode of motion, this for developed capitalist production. Before, in consequence of the rise of wages, any positive increase of the population really fit for work could occur, the time would have been passed again and again, during which the industrial campaign must have been carried through, the battle fought and won. Between 1849 and 1859, a rise of wages practically insignificant, though accompanied by falling prices of corn, took place in the English agricultural districts. In Wiltshire, for example, the weekly wages rose from seven shillings to eight shillings, in Dorsetshire from seven shillings or eight shillings to nine shillings, and etc. This was the result of an unusual exodus of the agricultural surplus population caused by the demands of war, the vast extension of railroads, factories, mines, etc. The lower the wages, the higher is the proportion in which ever so insignificant a rise of them expresses itself. If the weekly wage, for example, is twenty shillings, and it rises to twenty-two shillings, that is a rise of ten per cent. But if it is only seven shillings, and it rises to nine shillings, that is a rise of twenty-eight and four-sevenths per cent, which sounds very fine. Everywhere the farmers were howling, and the London economist, with reference to these starvation wages, prattled quite seriously of a general and substantial advance. What did the farmers do now? Did they wait until, in consequence of this brilliant remuneration, the agricultural laborers had so increased and multiplied that their wages must fall again, as prescribed by the dogmatic economic brain? They introduced more machinery, and in a moment the laborers were redundant again in a proportion satisfactory even to the farmers. There was now more capital laid out in agriculture than before, and in a more productive form. With this, the demand for labor fell, not only relatively, but absolutely. Footnote. Economist, January 21st, 1860. End note. The above economic fiction confuses the laws that regulate the general movement of wages, or the ratio between the working class, i.e., the total labor power, and the total social capital, with the laws that distribute the working population over the different spheres of production, if, for example, in consequence of favorable circumstances, accumulation in a particular sphere of production becomes especially active, and profits in it, being greater than the average profits, attract additional capital, of course the demand for labor rises and wages also rise. The higher wages draw a larger part of the working population into the favored sphere, until it is glutted with labor power, and wages at length fall again to their average level or below it, if the pressure is too great. Then, not only does the immigration of laborers into the branch of industry in question cease, it gives place to their emigration. Here the political economist thinks he sees the why and wherefore of an absolute increase of workers, accompanying an increase of wages, and of a diminution of wages, accompanying an absolute increase of laborers. But he sees really only the local oscillation of the labor market in a particular sphere of production, he sees only the phenomena accompanying the distribution of the working population into the different spheres of outlay of capital, according to its varying needs. The Industrial Reserve Army, during the periods of stagnation and average prosperity, weighs down the active labor army. During the periods of overproduction and paroxysm, it holds its pretensions in check. Relative surplus population is therefore the pivot upon which the law of demand and supply of labor works. It confines the field of action of this law within the limits absolutely convenient to the activity of exploitation and to the domination of capital. This is the place to return to one of the grand exploits of economic apologetics. It will be remembered that if, through the introduction of new, or the extension of old machinery, a portion of variable capital is transformed into constant, the economic apologist interprets this operation which fixes capital, and by that very act sets laborers free, in exactly the opposite way, pretending that it sets free capital for the laborers. 
Only now can one fully understand the effrontery of these apologists. What are set free are not only the laborers immediately turned out by the machines, but also their future substitutes in the rising generation, and the additional contingent, that with the usual extension of trade on the old basis, would be regularly absorbed. They are now all set free, and every bit of new capital looking out for employment can dispose of them. Whether it attracts them or others, the effect on the general labor demand will be nil, if this capital is just sufficient to take out of the market as many laborers as the machines threw upon it. If it employs a smaller number, that of the supernumeraries increases. If it employs a greater, the general demand for labor only increases to the extent of the excess of the employed over those set free. The impulse that additional capital, seeking an outlet, would otherwise have given to the general demand for labor, is therefore in every case neutralized to the extent of the laborers thrown out of employment by the machine. That is to say, the mechanism of capitalistic production so manages matters that the absolute increase of capital is accompanied by no corresponding rise in the general demand for labor. And this the apologist calls a compensation for the misery the sufferings, the possible death of the displaced laborers during the transition period that banishes them into the industrial reserve army. The demand for labor is not identical with increase of capital, nor supply of labor with increase of the working class. It is not a case of two independent forces working on one another. Les descents pipes. Capital works on both sides at the same time. If its accumulation, on the one hand, increases the demand for labor, it increases, on the other, the supply of laborers by the setting free of them, whilst at the same time the pressure of the unemployed compels those that are employed to furnish more labor, and therefore makes the supply of labor, to a certain extent, independent of the supply of laborers. The action of the law of supply and demand of labor on this basis completes the despotism of capital. As soon, therefore, as the laborers learn the secret, how it comes to pass that in the same measure as they work more, they produce more wealth for others, and as the productive power of their labor increases, so in the same measure even their function as a means of the self-expansion of capital becomes more and more precarious for them, as soon as they discover that the degree of intensity of the competition among themselves depends wholly on the pressure of the relative surplus population, as soon as, by trades unions, etc., they try to organize a regular cooperation between employed and unemployed in order to destroy or weaken the ruinous effects of this natural law of capitalistic production on their class, so soon as capital and its sycophant political economy cry out at the infringement of the eternal and, so to say, sacred law of supply and demand. Every combination of employed and unemployed disturbs the harmonious action of this law. But on the other hand, as soon as, in the colonies, for example, adverse circumstances prevent the creation of an industrial reserve army, and with it the absolute dependence of the working class upon the capitalist class, along with its commonplace Sancho Panza, rebels against the sacred law of supply and demand, and tries to check its inconvenient action by forcible means and state interference. 